Hello, uh, I'm Mike McCormick. I'm going to read from uh, my forthcoming novel, Solar Bones. I'm going to read a passage from the very near the beginning uh, in which the narrator, uh, Marcus Conway, an engineer in his early 50s, he reminisces about his father and about his father's, uh, his father's own uh, kind of aptitude for dismantling things and taking things apart uh, in order to see how they would work. And um, this kind of introduces the style of the book as well, so it's a continuous, free-flowing piece. And uh, this is from page 20 onwards. So any image of collapse or things coming apart always summons up memories of my father. Not the ragged shambles who would come at the end of his life, but the quick man with the large hands and the ready laugh I knew from childhood. The man who was such a deft touch at dismantling things and putting them back together again, harrows, ploughs and scufflers. Not necessarily because of any fault or redundancy in the constructs themselves, but because there was in him that need to know how these things held together so that he could be assured his faith in them was well placed. And one of my first memories dates back to a day in childhood when I stood beside him in a hay shed and he had one of those implements dismantled across the concrete floor, a harrow, a plough, a scuffler, one of those robust constructs that slept standing at the end of the hay shed dreaming their iron dreams through the winter months, implements which, even if they had not essentially evolved since the medieval period in which they were perfected, were still in use on our farm, as on many others right up into the 1980s, harrows, ploughs and scufflers. Implements from a more solid age when the world was measured out in lumpish increments like pounds and ounces, shillings and pence. Standing at the far end of the hay shed during the fallow months of autumn and winter, all tempered blades and forged spikes held together with banded timber and biding their time as if they were the very embodiment of their own names and were indeed instruments of torment. Harrows, ploughs and scufflers. Names so evocative of torment that years later when I attended a conference on bridge construction in Prague or as months later marred with crying in a broken hull, fucking bridge construction, I found myself browsing through the Museum of Torture near the Charles Bridge I was shocked to recognise in scale and material the exact same principles of construction echoed in those instruments of torment standing in the murky light of that dilapidated ex exhibition. Baleful assemblages which were persuasive tools of various judicial and ecclesial authorities, all dating from a time when the world was ever mindful of its sinfulness, but sure of its judgement and had, by way of engineering, gone to some lengths to pry, screw and pressurise the truth into the light so that it stood now in a shadowed bloom, the maiden, the rack and the wheel. And they too were all banded timber and spikes, blunt constructs held together with bolts and dome-headed rivets, which, at that crucial stage in their forging, would have glowed white hot. Contraptions, so evocative of pain and torment in the tenebrous light of the museum that gradually my mood sifted down within me to an anxious shame. As it became clear from their craft and complexity that these machines with their screws and gearing mechanisms were at a time when the level of engineering was at its lowest point in the Western world since antiquity, the highest technical expressions of their age, the end to which skilled minds had deployed their gift, the wretched and that ignoble instance of engineers' vocation that I felt sorrowful, for although I was young at the time, I already had a keen sense that engineering was a high and noble calling, firmly on the side of human betterment, where it stood shoulder to shoulder with a host of other values loosely grouped at the social democratic end of the political strip as I understood it then, so that, lost in these thoughts, I wandered through the exhibits among the shadows and brocade, until I realised, or had to admit to myself, that I'd been stalking an auburn-haired woman in a quilted anorak whose face was burnished red from the sub-zero temperature which crippled Prague in February of that year, and which was causing her to sniffle into a tissue as she moved past the exhibits, dwelling on each one in turn before ticking them off in a scraggy catalogue. And her allure was not merely her looks, nor the methodical way she went about the exhibition, but the fact that we were the only two people present on that winter afternoon, and in our separate solitude had now come together in a kind of intricate courtship dance, with and against each other, a delicate gavotte around the exhibits and down through the golden age of mechanised agony, till finally came shoulder to shoulder before a Catherine wheel, one of those complex mechanisms which deployed with clamps and blades and spikes, 
All those pressures and tensions which sunder flesh and bone, all the ways of mechanical anguish which quickly lost me in my attempt to fathom exactly what sort of imagination lay behind such a machine, with all its evident ingenuity. Most especially that awful alignment by which the body weight of the accused slowly but inevitably overcame the strength needed to uphold it and the gradual downward pressure collapsed it eventually, impaling it slowly. These thoughts gone through my mind when I heard a woman standing beside me in an American accent say, that's all about sex, isn't it? They were obsessed with it. Something I had not noticed, but which now the idea prompted seemed obviously enough. The true origin and object of all that pressure is penetrating and tearing, and now with these images clear in my head and this woman looking at me from over her tissue, it appeared also that I had assented to something more than the truth of her proposition. Fucking bridge construction, Mari, the wailed when they stumbled upon all this. And even if the encounter never quite delivered on all the shameless fucking I promised in those first charged moments among the exhibits, even if it was something genuinely tender over the course of a few days in a small hotel in the workers' suburb of Zhishkov, an erotic interlude which at the time I held dear and was ashamed of in one and the same moment, grateful in many ways, but relieved that we took leave of each other, with no intention whatsoever of further meeting or keeping in touch, so that bridge building, married, choked. The story of another man from another age, something remembered standing here in this kitchen, only because it is woven into the memorial arc, which curves from childhood to the present moment, gathering up memories of that time with my father and our farm, a skein of connections I am not likely to unravel at this moment for fear they might banish forever the image of all those agricultural implements and machines which we kept around the barns during my childhood and which my father would take apart on the floor of the hay shed. Simple constructs from an age when the world understood itself differently. Ploughs, harrows and scufflers, pounds, shillings and pence. Rough hewn vernacular instruments which were primitively crude compared to the laid elegance of the one true machine around which all the energy and work on the farm centred, the farm soul in many ways. The grey Massey Ferguson 35 my father bought at an agricultural show in Westport in the late 60s, paying £480 for it, a machine he was forever tinkering with, always scrutinising with some part of its engine peering into it, standing back from it and clearing his hands on an old rag, having made some adjustment to its working. A memory so clear to me now, here in this kitchen, that I could reach out and touch it with my hand. Man and machine, same as they were the day I came home from school and walked into the hay shed to fight him, standing there over the engine, completely broken down and laid out on the concrete floor that was dusted with hayseed, piece by piece along its length. Cylinder heads, pension, pistons, crankshaft, to where I stood in the doorway in my school trousers and sweater, terrified at the sight because to one side lay the body of the 35, gutted of its most essential parts and forlorn now, its components ordered across the floor in such a way as to make clear not only the sequence of its dismantlement, but also the reverse order in which it would be restored to the full working harmonic of itself. And my father standing over the whole thing, sighting through a lar narrow length of fuel line, blown through it till he was satisfied that it was clean through its length before he laid it on the floor, giving it its proper place in the sequence and explaining to me, saying simply, it was burning oil.